how can parents work to better partner with their children's teachers in school? I'm going to go back to what she was saying earlier about the whole transparency and accountability piece, and I think that was kind of the theme or the tone. Um, parents, <clears throat> parents, I think I think we're off to a good start because we're starting to see again, uh, because of folks like Moms for Liberty and some other groups all over the country, really start to push and advocate for parents to really get back involved and engaged into the, uh, the process of educating their child, like sitting on school boards, you know? And um, so I would start there, and I'm gonna let the rest of them go on, but I wanna start there because uh, that's very important. And then again, that transparency and accountability piece. I, I come from the private school world. In this world, the, the National Association of, of Independent Schools has directives that they give to all the member schools to the boards of those schools, to the heads of those schools, and they specifically say in that material that the, that the school is the quote unquote senior partner in the relationship between, uh, with the parent. That they are the guardians of the child's ex uh, education, that they are the trusted experts, and that when parents uh, question it, they are to be managed, and they have specific ways of managing parents, which are diabolical, in my opinion. They are doublespeak. They are humoring you. They are stringing you along. They are telling you that, it's, that whatever you say is very important. And I experienced this, too, as a teacher, um, in that I was humored. Uh, I, I was actually enthusiastically agreed with by the same administration um, that threw me under the bus. Uh, when the chips were down. And, you know, in my world, my advice to parents is, unless you see it actually in policy, in a policy change by the school, or manifested in the instructions to teachers, and the, the administration was arguing, it's not real. You cannot trust it. And uh, the, other asp the other component of the solution is that, it goes back to something James said, which was, they want to call everything racist in order to control it. Now this is where the rubber meets the road when you have parents that are very, very vulnerable um, and, and they, f you know, they don't have a lot of moral authority because they've lost connection with morality themselves, right? So they're vulnerable to these accusations. And so what, what I would tell parents is no, look, look deep within yourself, right? Look in your conscience. If you know you're not a racist, you're not a racist, okay? And you can operate from that moral certainty, because what they've done is they've redefined what racist means. Yeah. They've redefined what a woman means. They've redefined what a vaccine is, right? Hello. If you debate the truth with false definitions, you cannot win. We need to get back to the true definitions of words. And we need to frame, instead of trying to prove, oh, I'm not racist, I believe in social justice too, which some people say is the way to argue, you have to show, you have to go back to those 10 principles that we heard earlier in the day, and you have to say, no, you are anti-liberty, you are anti-equality, you are anti-justice. And we need to make that point clear in the places where decisions are made, not just in the information stream, not just in writing articles, which are great, but where, you know, where those public conversations with administrators take place, because that is where you actually move the decision making. So Paul is a fellow at Chalkboard Review and I already know we're gonna get emails about that this afternoon and uh, I look forward to ignoring those. Um, I'm gonna flip it around. How many of you have seen the movie Hoosiers? Anyone out there seen the movie Hoosiers? Okay, that was the first school I taught in, in Indiana. Uh, and I would get up at 4.30 in the morning on some really cold winter mornings and go shoot free throws very terribly in that gym because it was, you know, it was really cool, it was the Hoosier gym. And if you haven't seen the movie, you have no idea what I'm talking about, I don't care. So. <laughs> In that school, my parents took care of me. The union never spoke to me ever. My parents made sure that I needed, if there was something I needed, that I had it. If they asked questions, I answered them. And other teachers were doing things in the school that I thought they might like to know, I let them know. And it was that relationship between myself and those parents that not only got me through my first two years teaching, but I also think was instrumental in my getting teacher of the year both years. Because by working with those homes and saying, I am here to make what you do in the home stronger, well-protected, well-insured, well-enriched, and fully realized, 
I was able to strengthen their home as an outside partner, not as someone who has authority over their child and how they raise their kids, but as someone who is able to strengthen that. And I think that that's not talked about a lot today. There's, there's like almost this level of dark, stormy clouds over talking with your teacher anymore and going both ways, talking with your parents. And that is so sad because it is within those conversations that I found out first if the kid was going through stuff, if there was trouble at home, if they were dealing with some kind of an illness, if they were struggling with whatever. And my parents expected me to communicate with them and it was that equal amount of expectation and encouragement that not only got me through my first couple of years teaching, that helped me flourish and that needs to be encouraged. So Erica, Absolutely. Erica, I, I'd love for you to answer that question, but then I also want to kind of ask you as a, a, a fellow mom, I know you have three boys, right? So when a lot of these things are happening in the classroom, what's your advice to parents talking to their children about the fact that there may be things introduced in the classroom that are antithetical to the teaching in the home? And, you know, we need to have these hard conversations starting at earlier and earlier ages. Someone asked me the other day, when should I start talking to my child? And I said the first day that they're going before they even go to school, you need to be having this conversation. So if you could touch on that a little bit, too. And, and I feel awful for any parent who send, is, feels forced to send their child to a place that, that they believe is teaching contrary to their values. And I would agree with the speaker earlier. The place is on fire. Get your kid out now and do whatever, you, whatever it takes to get them out of there because they're, they're being damaged. Uh, I had to do it uh, at the time when I finally broke and took my child out of public school, children. Um, I had to put the rest of the private school tuition on a credit card and I couldn't afford it. But it was more important to me to go into debt than to allow my child to continue to, to be damaged in, the, in that school system, um, in the A school that I bought a house for the children to go to. Um, but, but that's my story as a mom. So the first thing is get them out. Uh, secondly, if you do have to or feel that you must continue to uh, send them to a school that's teaching contrary to your own values is to teach them at home. Uh, all values every single day and ask them what they're learning in school and have that dialogue with your kids. But as she said, I have three boys. And when you ask the question, what did you learn in school today? Uh, you don't get a very long answer for some of these boys. If you have boys, you know what I'm talking about. So um, really the answer is to entrust your children very, very carefully um, and, and be the parent who is in constant vigilance to your child's school, your child's teacher. Uh, one thing that I, I was going to give three, three ways, three practical ways that, um, that we can help with solutions, and, and um, one of them he just articulated very well from the home is support your child's teacher. Say, I'm here for you. Take the teacher's side, even if it's questionable. You know, stand with the teacher because, you know, these kids, they need to know that there's a united front between you and the teacher. And frankly, the teacher needs to know that there's a united front so that you can work together um, with your children. So that's number one is really try to support your teachers as much as possible from the home. Um, as a parent or community member, what Moms for Liberty is teaching you to do, going to the school board meetings, reading the agendas, understanding what questions need to be asked, what pre presentations that you want to see and putting the pressure on your school districts to be more accountable and more transparent as a group, that is so critically important. If they are left to their own devices, there is absolutely no accountability. They run through the ranks of leadership, through the administration, through the unions, and then they sit on the school board and they call it accountability. It's all the same. It's literally all the same. If it's not us on the school board holding them accountable, they're all on the same side. There, there's not an accountability because they've been through the ranks and then they came up to the school board. So you must get on school boards, you must go to the meetings, you must read the agendas, and you must do, go through these trainings that tell you what questions that need to be asked and hold them accountable. And then finally, at the state level, usually, is where you would advocate for school choice. If we had universal choice, parents wouldn't throw up their hands the way that they are. They don't do because they don't feel like what they do has any effect. If they don't feel like they have any option, they're going to behave as if the option that they're left with is the best one, if that makes sense. Because parents don't want to feel like they're not doing enough for their children, but the parents whose kids are trapped in a place that doesn't benefit them or is teaching contrary to their values or it doesn't even teach them to read, if, if that parent feels trapped in that space, they don't want to face the fact and that 
that may make them a bad parent because they haven't done anything to change the situation. And we're not saying they're bad parents. Some of them are trapped. Some of them can't do anything. But we must do everything we possibly can to give every single parent a choice because that accountability is going to come when a parent has to, every parent, right. has to go to uh, select a school for their child. And you, even if only 75% actually did it, which is what happens in Miami-Dade County, which is the largest choice district in the country, 75% of the, the parents in Miami-Dade County select a school that's outside their zone public school. And that's not an ideal system by any means. A lot of those are magnet schools, et cetera. However, it shows that there is a large majority of families, regardless of their level of income, that will actively choose a school if they're allowed that. And that provides them that ownership and that involvement that we need to see in order to maintain accountability long term. And that's what we really should be fighting for at the state level. That's a great answer. Thank Can I add something else? Uh, another tip for parents. Um, uh, one of the things that I've learned in the work that I've done, not only at the Department of Ed, but now here at Heritage Foundation, is if you have to go uh, to the sun to look for data on how that school district is actually doing and how your students measure up to their, to their peers, for goodness sake, you talk about transparency. I mean, I've literally gone on to web, school websites and, you know, they have what the kids had for lunch and how to get them signed up for transportation and all this other stuff. If you have to go through high heavens just to look to see what the district data is, that should be or pose of great concern yeah. when you're talking about transparency and accountability. That means they don't really want you to know where they measure up. It's like a website from 2003. Absolutely. Like runs on a potato. <laughs> yeah. 15 clicks to go through. Yep. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Some PDFs put on there. Yep. Right. One, one little tip. If you, have a, if you have a child in an institution that has some, some sort of, in, you know, homework um, content management system, very often the parents don't have access to it independently you can sometimes get access to that and see the assignments, see the syllabus, see everything that's gonna, you know, that child's gonna be learning by, by uh, petitioning the administration to say, I would like to be working with my child to support their learning. Um, you know, if they're, they may, they're having trouble in these classes, they usually can't s separate it out, and that's a good thing anyway. I mean, that's what you wanna be doing anyway. Um, but very often they, they will respond to that in a way that gives you access to that material. Canvas, Schoology, Chalkboard, Genzibar, and Discovery Education all have systems set up in place to provide independent access. And if any of you are told at any point in time that your school's LMS, learning management system, software, whatever, doesn't accommodate for that, reach out to us at Chalkboard Review because I have a master's degree in saying that that's garbage <laughs> and that's not the way that is. Please reach out, we will get that resolved. I'm going to um, open this up for questions. Is there anything else that you'd like to, anyone would like to share that we haven't covered yet before we get to questions? No, I would like to just add, though. Yes, sir. On the table, uh, there are some QR codes um, for, uh, since we are celebrating the life of uh, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, at the Heritage Foundation, we actually had these uh, shipped here. And so on the table over there, please grab one of these. Um, you can scan it with your phone. It'll take you directly to levelupcivics.org, where we do have a uh, MLK series of different videos um, to learn from on there about his life and the great work that he's done. And I also have other materials over there on the table as well. I see the CRT booklets left real quick. So, But there are some essential constitutions and those kind of things over there about the Foner Institute as well. So please, please have at it. And the, uh, the chalkboardreview.com has a critical race theory toolkit that will help you get started with the actual literature involved, including a reading list, including short summaries of the authors. Paul, I believe you actually helped us work on that. Yeah, I, I have something in there. Yeah, so that is updated semi-frequently so that you can read it yourself. I don't need to tell you why critical race theory is good or bad. You can read it and make that decision because you're competent researching individuals. That way, when the people out there tell you that you don't know anything about it, you can share the literature with them.